these are the famous New Orleans street tiles. And even if you've never visited the city before, you've probably still seen them. But that might not be for much longer. The street tiles are disappearing, and it's not because people are stealing them. Since Hurricane Katrina, we've literally lost about 18% of the tiles that we had at that point. And we were losing them before, now it's just, it's getting worse. In my neighborhood alone, it was being lost at an 80% rate. So if I look at just that little sliver of a 10 by 10 blocked area in my own neighborhood where I walk my dog all the time and I notice it, what is going on in all these other neighborhoods? Orleans has a lot of issues with broken sidewalks, broken streets. I don't know if it's the, the base, the ground. I just see it all over the city of New Orleans. The tiles are important to the city because generations of us grew up having them on our street corners. And then one day, they might be gone. Before learning about what's happening to the tiles, you need to understand that there's so many different types of tiles in this mosaic city. There are blue, white, old, painted, concrete, ceramic, glazed, but not that glazed, unglazed, machine-made, handmade, big script, little script, and no script at all. And while there's a massive variety of tiles, we're only gonna focus on three main types. Belgian shadow, Belgian, and American. Well, if you're walking around the streets of New Orleans, you're gonna see three main types of tile, and that would be the Belgian shadow tiles, the plain Belgian tiles, and the American pinstripes. The Belgian tiles were first in the late 1880s, and that font is, it's missing here, but what it was is basically this outline font, but it had a shadow line around it. This used to be the Archbishopric in New Orleans, so these tiles would be no later than 1899. And this is the saint Lane shadow tiles, the Belgian shadows. The basic letter is the same as in the ordinary tiles. The difference with the shadows is that they have a wide, wide outline and then a shadow behind the letter. But then you start to see around town a lot the blue Belgians, which is the background with the white letter. You see the white background with the blue letter. Those are the Belgian tiles that you see. They're flat, they have points on the letter, and there's no groove. You don't feel any groove between the colors on the tile. All right, these are Belgian blues. There are probably less of these in the city than of the regular Belgians, so I'm thinking these might be a kind of a missing link in between the shadowed Belgians and the plain Belgians. And it might have been a situation where they decided that it was too hard to read these at night, so they flipped the colors. That's the only thing I can think of why they would have changed. Those were the Belgian blues. Now let's take a look at one of the most common tiles you'll find in the city, the Plain Belgians. This is uh, Cemetery Dispersed of Judah, and we've already lost a couple of tiles from here. Hopefully they're inside, ooh. But something that's really awesome that I just noticed is when we lost this tile, they left the imprint of the maker behind in the cement. It's fancy. That's one of the things that used to kind of drive me nuts is people would say these, these tiles are Belgians, these tiles are American. Well, how do you know? It became like a, a mythical story. Well, all tiles that aren't Americans come from Belgium. And it wasn't until I actually found a couple of tiles myself and could turn them over and that I actually proved, well, yes, it is from Belgium. Yeah, there's the W, which is the mark for the Welkin Rat Factory. And then backwards is the B-E-L-G-I-U-M. But these were here a little while ago. The next style that is most recognizable, I think, to most people is the American encaustic font. So this one is a flat tile, but it has a groove around it with a pinstripe outline. These are the tiles for Salvatore Giolanza's stables, and these, I think, are probably the first Americans that went into the streets of New Orleans somewhere between 1896 and 
1901. I think the Americans probably are more popular in the media because they're probably more newer looking, less damaged to some of them, and they are on most of the major streets. You don't have to walk too far to find an American. The last distinction that needs to be made about the street tiles is that they are original and they are reproductions. The most authentic of the reproductions are made by Derby Pottery and Tile on Magazine Street. So we chose to make the American and Caustic Tile Company's font, and we chose a style that they made that was pretty rare, which was a yellow outline. To not deceive old versus new, my tile versus historic, I'm gonna go consistently with this yellow line and then hopefully people who encounter these in the street are gonna be able to identify that looks like a replacement versus these are original. What do you wish New Orleanians knew about street tiles? I would like people to have just a general knowledge of what they're seeing and, and even not to just comment, but just to explore the richness that's here even more. The street tiles started appearing in the late 1880s, but the city itself was founded in 1718, 150 years earlier. So how did the street tiles become popular in New Orleans? New Orleans has always had street sign problems. If you go back and look in the, in the papers at the time, there's always someone complaining that there's no street sign here, there's no street sign there. Someone stole the street sign from here and moved it over here. And for the most part, it wasn't really New Orleans' fault because New Orleans was built piecemeal. So at some point, New Orleans had to decide, well, yeah, okay, we need a solution for street names. And that solution ended up being small aluminum plates affixed to the top of the top corners of the houses on the street corners. Nothing to do with the tiles whatsoever. The tiles are almost certainly grown from the contractor perspective. A man named Prosper Lamal, who was a Belgian, was in charge of the Belgian exhibit at World's Fair. Eventually he came to New Orleans for the 1884-1885 World Cotton Centennial. And he was arrested for smoking in the building. By the end of 1885, he had opened up the Comptoir Industrial Belge, which was basically an import-export for Belgian goods. I mean, everything from shotguns to paving stones, marble clocks. And one of the things he eventually started importing was the tiles. So yeah, Prosper Le Mall probably had the idea mainly to put fancy tiles in front of businesses. And there were three or four locations right surrounding his business where the tiles showed up. When do you think this was put in? How old do you think this is? Given proximity to Le Mall's, uh offices, it's close enough that this could have been one of the earlier sets that went in. So if you see the shadow tiles, you're definitely looking at some of the oldest tiles in the streets. From there, somehow Prosper Lamal convinces the sidewalk contractors. For a small price, they can put these tiles on the corners that will denote the street names, and that might give them an edge getting a city contract. So the tiles start appearing more and more and more. Then Prosper Lamal dies in 1895. All of a sudden, there's nobody importing the tiles anymore. But that's when the Americans started appearing, is in the late 1890s and the early 1900s. So it's possible that Prosper's death ended the Belgian side of it, and the American tiles from the American Acoustic Tiling Company of Zanesville, Ohio, started showing up on the streets. So Capo's Grocery is one of the ones that we can kind of nail down a date to, because he was only at this location between 1908 and 1913 and it would kind of be pointless for him to put the tiles in before or after he was here, so that's when these tiles went in. People tend to think that the tiles are unique to New Orleans, and we do have more than any other city, but they do appear in other cities. They're in Joliet, Illinois, and Kansas City, Missouri, most notably Victoria, British Columbia has, I think, probably about 70 or 80 examples left in their streets, and they're the same tile as the American pinstripes, but in a reverse color format. Why do you think New Orleans took off with the street tiles, whereas so many other cities that maybe have tried, but just kind of like petered out? I would think probably because a combination of the contractors enjoying getting the extra work, 
and the city not having to worry about putting street signs up. Because the tiles don't actually die out until the steel and tin street signs start going up on poles. And after that, the, the tiles just sort of fell by the wayside. And it was probably more economical too. You'd have to have a craftsman put the tiles in, whereas you just needed a guy with a screwdriver to put the signs on. I would think Prosper Lamal is probably the man who, if he didn't think of it himself, planted the seed of putting the names on corners. And the street tile progress remained relatively dormant from the 1930s until 2005 with the arrival of Hurricane Katrina. And it was due to the city's destruction that Clay Craftsman, Anne Marie, and Mark Derby began their tile restoration project. So we were in a position of returning to the city and wanting to contribute in some way to the rebuild. Being a native of 200 and whatever, 50 years or whatever heritage here, it felt like an honor to figure out, you know, like we had this opportunity to really contribute to something that was lasting. The uh, tiles we've been looking at prior to the ones that we make. These are all machine made, very industrial revolution technology. They put a brass mold of a letter inside. They fill the letter part with whatever color it's gonna be, in this case, blue. They fill the outside with the white, and it's a slurry of cement, pigment, and water. Then they throw a rougher cement behind it for support, and that cement's dry, and they compress it under hydraulic pressure, and after 10 seconds, you have a tile. You just take it out and you let it dry for a month. I think in the old days, there was one mold that made multiple letters throughout the day. In our situation, we're a small artisan studio and needed to use available technology to independent operators like we are. It's a more artistic process and the original tiles were basically all manufacturing. It was product, make as many as you can in a day, get it out because we got tons of streets with tons of names or whatever people were using them for. With there being four different kinds of clay, we start with a powder. We start with the ground up minerals and components of different types of clays and we mix them all in with many gallons of water to get our liquid clay, which I'm gonna stir up here. First, we gotta get some yellow, which we've already pre-mixed with pigment. And then we stir up the yellow. So we get the blue stirred up and get it ready. And then we're gonna get some blue. All righty. One thing that I found that is really finicky and changes a lot is the minerals. If we're mixing minerals that have been mined at a different mine in a different place, the yellow and the cobalt changes. And this is one of the reasons why American encaustic tiles have a variety of different color outlines. Gray, gold, and buff, which is a light brownish yellow. Over the years, not all the minerals came from the same mines, and the purity of the ingredients may also have varied. Not to mention the clay mixing process may also have changed. People have an image in their head of New Orleans tiles being uh, blue with a gold pinstripe, but from all the examples I've seen, the gold pinstripes are few and far between in the city. The more common ones are the buff pinstripes, and that's what we're looking at here. The gold pinstripe, when you see them, they tend to be just one or two letters out of a bunch. And if you take a look at these tiles, you can tell that a couple of them have been replaced. The F and the G have different colorations for the background, and those kind of match the W and the D. So it seems to me that the gold pinstripes were used as replacements back in the 20s and 30s. So what we did is we went out into the streets and we traced every single letter of the alphabet. And we came back and we made a master clay tile from it. And then we cast that clay tile into making our own molds. And so we're gonna put the yellow into the outline to get our signature yellow golden outline. And so that's not yellow, it's, uh, it's brown. Can you explain what happens? Well, just like when rock goes through a metamorphosis, when heat is applied to it, 
and volcanoes or whatever, our minerals change color when we put them in the kiln. So if I was to put the blue into that right now with it being liquidy like that, they would just run together and make a mess. So that's why we have to wait for the yellow to dry before we put the blue attaching to it. So that way there are two distinct lines. You see now how it's more of a matte uh, surface. The water has been absorbed into the mold. This is like the interior of the tile, right? What's below it is going to be the face of the tile. Now that the blue and the yellow are sufficiently dry, we will put the two parts together, bind them up so that the liquid white clay does not leak out. Now what is even cooler, in five minutes from now, this is going to sink down from here at the top to about right there. And then I have to keep filling it, keep filling it, keep filling it for about an hour and a half before it sets just enough that we don't need to keep adding slip to it. Recently we figured out that when we mix this whole batch of slip to make, you know, 150 tiles is about what one big thing of slip will make, we realized that it takes two weeks about for 110 gallons of water to evaporate into our space here. Isn't that crazy? So we start at this size, making it out of liquid slip. And then you can see this is a tile that has sat overnight. And look how much smaller it is just by the evaporation of water that was here just yesterday. So already this tile has shrunk that much in one day. To make a tile, it takes two weeks from the very start of putting down the liquid clay to it being dry enough so that it can just go into a kiln and spend two days in a kiln. So it takes about almost two and a half weeks. And then we've got finished tiles inside and then again you get an indication of the size differential of the unfired and fired. This is what it looks like a day out of the mold and this is what it looks like after it comes out of the kiln. The importance of uh, this color being below the surface is this is going to last and wear much longer. So these were developed in, for high traffic areas. When you realize that horses and carriages were clomping over this every day in and out for decades and you can still read it is a testament to how they were put together. And that's why it's so important that the replacements are encaustic, meaning inlaid and not painted because they'll never last in a city with constant flooding and foot traffic. And the encaustic features aren't only limited to the American tiles, but the Belgians have it as well. If you come up to this one, you can see exactly how they're put together. The pigmented cement actually goes down like a quarter of an inch, which is why after, you know, 100 years, you can still read these things. A major distinction between originals and reproduction tiles is that the originals were factory made but now the reproductions are made by hand. We've had someone just last week ask us, you know, you could work a whole lot less and a whole lot less hard and get them made somewhere else. But the prospect of that is ludicrous to me because they're made where they're being revitalized. And despite the fact that derby pottery and tile is making replacements, the street tiles are still disappearing at astounding rates. 
and it's not because they're being stolen. What's happening with the tiles today is uh, the tiles are quite frankly disappearing. Since Hurricane Katrina with the uh, construction crews, we've literally lost about 18% of the tiles that we had at that point. And we were losing them before, now it's just, it's getting worse. In my neighborhood alone, it was being lost at an 80% rate of what the construction was happening just here in the past two years. So if I look at just that little sliver of a 10 by 10 blocked area in my own neighborhood where I walk my dog all the time and I notice it, what is going on in all these other neighborhoods? So meet Robbie Ward. He's a superintendent with over 30 years of concrete experience and has spent the last four years working for roof contractors. We do all kind of concrete work, streets, wheelchair ramps, sidewalks, curb, a little bit of everything concerning concrete. We do a little asphalt work. We just finished up a project in City Park and we installed a lot of street tiles. The corners that had street tiles, we took them out, tried to save them. If we could save them, we, in, we put them back in when we poured the new ramps. Every corner that had letters, we had to put them back in there, you know. How many letters do you think that you replaced? I don't know, probably close to a thousand. Pulling up tiles intact isn't as easy as it sounds. The old concrete curbs are brittle and can be up to eight to 10 inches thick. So sometimes little can be done to save them. If you gotta soft cut this out and save it, I mean, it's, it's pretty hard, you know, it takes time consuming, but why a lot of people don't do it, I don't know. It's contracting crews are at fault, yeah. You're gonna have vandalism and you're gonna have kids goofing off, but I mean, that's gonna be like less than 1% probably of, of what's missing. Take for instance right here, if they had a water leak or, or, or gas leak or something, they was able to save these and do the work. But I've seen times where they would come just chop it, cut it, break it out, fix it, and then pour concrete back. And then you would only have half the letter, half the word there. I see that all over the city. The majority of it is, is contractor crews that come in that don't know what they're doing. That's where we lost the most, I think, was in the French Quarter over the last couple of years since 2007. Now, I think everything in the French Quarter is a repro, which it's nice that they're trying to put them in, but you would think that they could take some of the ones that they take up, they're not all broken. So maybe they could salvage some of the ones from the ones they take up and put them back into the ground somewhere else where they're needed, but they just seem to have disappeared. The energy might come fix a gas leak and then a small contractor or somebody, whoever works for them, will come in here and replace the concrete that they tore up. But you don't never, you don't see too many of the letters put back. They like gone. Once they break and throw them away on a dump truck, they gone. You don't see them no more. It's real easy to see. All you got to do is go on Google Map and look at it from 2007 when they first started having those images available to now. And you could see the lineage and you'll click on one in 2010. Street tiles are there. You click on them in 2012 when Google Maps went around and did their other imaging. They're gone. I see a lot of stuff where you have a brick sidewalk like on this corner and they'll have a water leak underneath it. Soldier water board will come, fix the water leak, but they may fill it in with rock or something. It's like they don't go back and put the brick back like it was. I mean, I don't, I don't know all the answers, but I just see it all over the city of New Orleans. I know energy always shows up and energy always answers with, oh, yep, yeah, we're aware of the problem. We're gonna make sure it doesn't happen again. And then five years later, it happens again. But every story you see in the paper about it, there's probably like 10 other incidents that don't make the paper. Worse than even the tiles disappearing, I think, I've seen tiles where the name is kept where it is, but they've drilled a hole through the middle of the name and put an electrical pole right down in and then cemented it in. It, it boggles my mind that this is, it's not craftsmanship. We have this rush to use these billions of dollars that were given to us by FEMA as a result of Katrina. And it took so long for the city to figure out what was necessary in that infrastructure that they're spending all this money at the last minute. You've got energy, you've got fiber optics, you've got gas lines, you've got now 5G, you've got sewer and water port, you've got DPW, you've got a host of reasons why they might get torn up. There's just too much work happening all at once. Yep. It's, it's an avalanche and they're overbooked and proper management suffers. 
Even if the street tiles are getting back into these curb cuts, You've got dump trucks with gravel rolling over them right after it's put in and breaking them up immediately. And while it's easy to point fingers at contractors and blame them for the disappearance of the street tiles, it's a whole host of things. It's 300-year-old infrastructure. It's the city's poor project management. It's underqualified contractors. It's the citizens' lack of awareness. And as Anne Marie puts it... I think who's at fault is, you know, we're a city that oftentimes, you know, we forget to care. If we accomplish one thing with this video, it's hopefully that the city will figure out the way to put the, put the names on the, on the corners when they do their replacements. The tiles should be placed upside down from the vantage point of the street, plain and simple. Because if you're on the street, you don't need to read the tile of the street you're on. You already know what street, or you should already know what street you're on. You need to read the tile of the street you're crossing. When the tiles are in upside down, it also means that the pedestrian is looking directly at the name and can read the name of the street they're approaching, both ways. It used to be in the 1880s that the tiles were laid with the pedestrian and horse and buggy in mind. The horses and carriages had a higher vantage point, which made it easier for them to see the street tiles on the ground. But with the invention of the car and lower vantage points, it made it difficult for drivers to read the tiles. And consequently, the city tried to change their orientation 180 degrees. But in the 1920s, street signs began to appear, which made the street tiles obsolete for car drivers. So today, because the end user is back to being the pedestrian, the tiles should be oriented for them, but instead, there's no clear guidance on which direction they should be. And that's it. Do not place the tiles readable from the street you're on. It's wrong, it's bad, and it, it drives me crazy. The first thing we got to do is saw cut at the limitations of where they want to install the ramp. Then we come out in the street and we saw out the gutter. If the street's staying in, we come out here and saw out the gutter about two foot out. If it has letters, like this one for instance, we have to saw cut around, around here as deep as we can. And then we'll start hoe ramming and work our way to these and then once we get hoe rammed around, we'll take them out. We save them, we move them to, the, to the, my yard, and then we set up our ramp, we dig it all out, we set it all up and get it ready. We bring those back out the morning to pour and we, put, we install these back in, get them level, and then we coat them with a little oil so the concrete don't stick to them, and then we wipe them all off and they're good to go. If we try to save these and they break and we can't reuse them, we gotta bring them to the yard, save them for the city of New Orleans, and then we install new letters. To install the new letters, we cut either a piece of wood or a piece of black expansion paper the size of the word. We embed it into the new concrete and then that makes our hole for our new letters. And then once I get a bunch of them done, we'll get the letters out here, we'll lay them all in there and grout them in and it's done. An important point that Robbie mentioned that's often overlooked is wipe down the tiles after they've been cemented in. It doesn't take but a sponge and a bit of water. Contractors have been laying street tiles in New Orleans for over a century. And not only has the direction of the names been debated, but also the direction of the individual letters. Sometimes individual letters are put in upside down in, inside the name. The N, the S, and the Z have definite tells that you can tell whether they're placed the correct way or not in a name. Oh yeah, this is a good example of the, the N's being upside down. This is correct. The serif should be at the top nothing at the bottom, that's upside down. We're having an upside down end, kind of adds a little bit of charm, but not too many of them. The S and the Z are a little harder to tell. It's a matter of a fraction of an inch on the serifs and on the uh, construction of the letter themselves. But if you stare at them for two decades like I have, it becomes apparent. So at the end of the day, what the city needs more of is awareness on how the tiles should be installed. It's not enough just to have the tiles in the streets, but rather to have them placed correctly in a manner that's historically accurate. The tiles are important to the city because generations of us grew up having them on our street corners. And then one day, 
they might be gone. It's happening wherever infrastructure is being improved. The downside is that the street tiles seem to be um, a casualty of that. It's part of the soul of our city. And it's one of the things that, even though other cities have tiles, it's one of the things that makes us unique. When I'm out taking photos sometimes, uh, people will walk up to me and ask me what I'm doing. I'm like, oh, I'm taking pictures of the tiles in the streets. It's like, and why are you doing that? And they're really defensive about, you know, some stranger coming in and even looking like they're gonna mess with their tiles. New Orleans has its own culturally identifiable font. Yep, a font, a letter that is shaped a certain way that no matter where you see it, it resonates with New Orleans. It's on jewelry, billboards, in front of businesses, it's on stickers that people put in their refrigerators, it's on t-shirts, it's everywhere, but the place that you're seeing it less and less now is where they first were, in the street corners. And while this all may sound like doom and gloom, there definitely is a lot of hope left to preserve this part of history. The billions allocated from FEMA are a double-edged sword which while it's caused a chaotic rush of construction contracts, it's also brought some unexpected collaboration. One of the great things to come as a result of this infrastructure project that's currently happening, New Orleans hasn't received this much money ever to do this much work in the streets. Now's our time to put them back in, and one of the great things that's come from this is We've been working with the city preservationist who is tagged by FEMA to ensure that they go back in. We're working with him on figuring out what is the best practice to install the tiles by the multiple contractors that are installing them. You know, how to put a clean install, how to put just enough of a grout line so that people can't pop them up as a souvenir. They just put out a new set of uh, guidelines. There's a $10,000 fine for destroying any set of tiles. But with that guideline comes a caveat. It can only be levied on new projects after the date the guideline was created. So most of the construction that's happening now falls before that time period and can't be subjected to that fine. But generally speaking, there are positive measures that are being taken to preserve the tiles. So I think we're, we're on an upswing. I think the damage is gonna be mitigated now and at least what is left of those hopefully will be preserved and at least replaced with a suitable replacement. But like everything, we can't solely rely on the city to preserve this part of history. As New Orleanians, it's paramount that we get involved in the process. And that's why we partnered with Look at This Fucking Street to create the NOSAP project to hold the city and contractors accountable for preserving and replacing the street tiles. And it's because of the conservation work of Michael, Robbie, Anne Marie, and Mark that we're able to continue a legacy of a mosaic city. And in the words of Mark, Though I've made them for 18 odd years, I'm still enjoying the process. Uh, it still challenges me <laughs> in all aspects of it. And so it's work I love to do, so. New Orleans, my gift to you. It's paramount that we get involved in a tiny 700 square foot shop on Magazine Street. In a tiny 700 foot square. That ant made by Brick Derby ah. has spent the last four years. And that's one of the... Which is a blue background. What the fuck is happening? It's paramount that we get involved. Gassi.